new series, and we will be here for, for a while. I don't know how long. We're just saying, okay, Lord, however long you, until, until the Lord says done. But we're going to be here for a while. This series is called Ohio for Jesus, and I'm sporting my Ohio for Jesus t-shirt. Um, so Ohio for Jesus is we want to see Ohio for Jesus. We want to see people in Ohio come to Jesus. There's actually, if you could put up, there's a, a recognizing, it starts with recognizing. If you could put up, Ohio for Jesus is recognizing a broken society is the outflow of a weakened church. And Vision Church aligns with the Ohio Ministry Network, the Assemblies of God, and we seek to awaken a sleeping giant. That sleeping giant, friends, is the church. We, desi we desire to develop and deploy spirit-empowered Spirit-empowered leaders for a healthy, multiplying churches and ministries to see people forgiven, people healed, and whole. We unite with the, uh, the OMN, Ohio Ministry Network's 10-year strategic initiative called Ohio for Jesus. We know that God is calling us for Ohio for Jesus, but we know it's not going to happen um, in one day. It's, it's going to take all of us getting on board to do our part, to see Ohio for Jesus, to see revival in this state. And so we're going to ask you to join with us in this next season to, to be as at many Sunday morning services as you possibly can. If you can't be here in person, to make sure you watch online because over the next several weeks, maybe months, we're going to lay out some of the strategic plan to see Ohio for Jesus. It is bigger than Vision Church, Waterville Campus. It is bigger than both of campuses, Waterville and South Toledo together is bigger um, than, than just one church. This is, a, uh, this is all of the Assembly of God churches working together and along with even other churches that are outside of our denomination to say, with God, all things are possible. You know, we are living in a time right now that there is so much discouragement in the church. I just had a pastor's meeting this week, and, and I don't remember in 20 years of doing these meetings ever seeing a meeting where it seems as heavy as it was at this last meeting. Because, well, because it's a lot going on. It's a lot going on. And I don't mean to minimize things like, oh, well, you know, give a little soft, like, oh, well, you know, just a little no thoughtful kind of answer. You know how sometimes someone's going through things and we're like, oh, it's okay. God has you. We'll pray for you. And, and we're not really showing any empathy or compassion. I, that, that's not what I mean to do here because we need to, we need to realize sometimes when, there, when, when we feel heavy, when there's a lot of heavy things going on, God doesn't want us to carry that burden by ourselves. You know, he does call us to carry one another's burdens, but he calls us to lay, ultimately to lay our burdens down at his feet. And he will give us rest. And I believe that there is no greater time in the world to, than now to be a part of the church. Because we need Jesus so much. <laughs> like, like, we really, really need Jesus. And we really, really can't do this without you. And so um, over the next several months, you're gonna, you're, we're going to talk about some different drivers that we want to see happen. We want to, you know, one of our main things we want to see is leader development. We want to see leaders, you know, rise up. We want to see more missionaries, more, more pastors, more, more lay leaders saying, I'm going to do this. But we want to see church health because we, we, we can't do it without church health. We want to see spirit-empowered people. We want to see discipleship, true discipleship really take place. We want, we want to help our body learn how to invite people, um, to, to go after people, invite people in, right? We want to see, we want to see church planning and we want to see missionaries deployed. But friends, I believe the first thing that we need to talk about today before laying out all these things that's going to take a number of years to happen is we need to bring it back in to really realize in order to do what God has called us to do, to see Ohio come to Jesus. That's what Ohio for Jesus means. We want to see the people in Ohio come to Jesus. Do you know that we are living now in a, in a generation, first time in America, that more people don't go to church than go to church? First time ever in America. It's like 47% of Americans still go to church. That it's just dipped under 50% and it just happened. And so there's no greater time than to invite people, to go after people, to, to love on people. But into, in order to do that, we've got to learn how to walk in the spirit. And I felt like this message is a great transitional message, if you will, from talking these last several weeks on 
the Holy Spirit to how can we win Ohio for Jesus, okay? And so I want to talk about, we've talked several times now, several weeks about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, having the gifts of the Spirit in operation, what the Holy, who the Holy Spirit is, that he is not a what, he is a, a who, and how to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work of God. And in order to do that, we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. Say, walk in the Spirit. So the, the scripture says in Galatians 5, 25, 5, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. In other words, if the Spirit lives in you, let him direct you, right? If he lives in you, then let him direct you. And walking in the Spirit, friends, <laughs> it's a walk of obedience, Mm, it's a walk of obedience. Walking in the spirit is to follow the spirit's leading. It's essentially walking with the Holy Spirit and allowing him to guide your steps and to conform your mind. It is a walk of obedience. Can you say walk of obedience? And I'm going to share with you um, four ways that we can learn how to walk in the spirit by obeying. Okay. Amen. First one uh, is we have to understand walking in the spirit means obeying when it's time to go. Obeying when it's time to go. Okay, you here today are, are, are seasoned saints. Most of you know the scripture that Jesus told his disciples. Um, one of the last things he said in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. I'm going to read it to you again as a reminder. And it's found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. What is it? To obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the end of the age. Walking in the spirit is a walk of obedience. And when the Holy Spirit tells us to go, we need to go. And so what does that mean exactly to go? Well, I, I believe that we have to uh, understand that in order to go, we can't really truly go unless we're empowered to go, which is why Jesus also said to wait into Jerusalem. Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes on you in power. And, and because when we go without the Holy Spirit, then we can have a lot of great church initiatives, church programs. We can have some, you know, pretty awesome things. But without the Holy Spirit, then it's, it's what man builds is not going to last. We need the Holy Spirit to build. Okay? And so there's a few things that the Holy Spirit always leads us to do. Always leads us to go and do. And we're going to talk about a few of those things. Um, a few of those things. He always leads us to share the gospel, the good news with others. Do you know among Generation Z and even millennials, um, sharing the gospel is something that they don't, that because of culture and what culture says, they believe that, that it's like propagating their faith. And so they have culture push up against them that tells them, you know, that, that no, 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 that's okay for you to have your faith. And that's okay for it to be, you know, your, your personal faith. And they take personal as in it means it's your private faith. But you can't push that on others. And so culture is pushing back against the commandment, the commission that Jesus gave his church which is to go into the world and to make disciples and to teach them to obey. And so I believe that every single one of us, we have to wake up. We have to wake up. The church has to wake up and, and we have to learn how to share the gospel. And we do have to be strategic about it because the reason there, there, there is, and I, I, the church never likes to admit when we do things wrong. <laughs> we don't like to say, oh yeah, we messed up there. Yeah, we weren't, we, weren't, we weren't great there. We weren't, we weren't very compassionate. We weren't very empathetic. We weren't like Jesus in that sense. And, and so there's some, there's some truth in, in what the, the world says about the church. And we have to look and we have to say, okay, 
You know, maybe in this, in the day and age, we have to know the times that we live in. We have to be, as Jesus says, as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves, right? We have to know, okay, maybe today is not the best time to just stand on a corner and beat someone over the head with the Bible. Maybe that's not the way to, to win someone to the Lord. Maybe we need to be a little bit more strategic. Maybe we need to be a little bit more intentional, but we got to know the truth and we got to have sound doctrine. We need to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. We need to be able to empower and equip our young people who we send them off into the mission field every time they go to school, friends. We need to equip them to be able to share their faith in a tangible, real way. I'm going to share a quick story. Um, at youth group, several, several months ago, we have what we call hot chairs. And we had the middle school in the front of the sanctuary. We had high schoolers in the back of the sanctuary. And we had a young man who um, admitted something. And I've done youth ministry on and off for 20-plus years, helped out with it. And uh, I see a young adult shaking her head. They know exactly what I'm about to say. We had a young man admit something that was very personal, um, very hard, uh, I would think, hard to admit. I've, I've walked with other young people, but never have I ever had a young person stand up and say, you know what, um, I struggle with same-sex same attraction, and I, I'm attracted to both men and women. And this is what the young man admitted in front of us. And I had, like, a word for everybody. And it got to him, and I was like, bup, 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 bup. I didn't know what to say. Because usually, I've had, if I have someone uh, confide in me with, with things, they've done it privately. I've never had that. And I was so thankful that there was another Generation Z person there, another teenager there that walked with the spirit that was able to interject and say, you know what? And just spoke life and said, just because someone calls you something that you don't have to identify, you don't have to ha have your identity wrapped up in everything. And the way, I can't even repeat exactly how this person spoke to him, but it was so spirit empowered that me and the other young adult, I say other, me and, and the other young adult in the circle, we just was like, Thank you, Jesus, for a teenager that's filled with the spirit that can speak truth in love in a situation. Because we were like, uh, you know what I mean? We didn't know what to say. But this is the thing. If we don't go and teach our young people how to correctly with gentleness and love, they're going through things, guys, that none of us have ever went through. Like they have to be more filled with the spirit than we ever even had to. Because the enemy is coming after them through social media, through culture, through friend groups, even in, the, even in, in Christian schools, man. They're going through what I went through in the 90s in the, in the public schools. Because, I mean, it's, it's just stuff. It's just the world is getting, as the Bible says, uh, as, as, the, as we enter more and more into the end times, the world is becoming even more wicked. And so we have to have the church to be even more empowered. And so I'm sharing this with you with the, to say this, that we still have to share the gospel. We still have to speak the truth in love, but we have to learn how to do it in a way that is God glorifying and, and honoring and respectful to people. I, I went back and there, one of my pastor friends um, went viral for um, the way he baptized somebody in his church. And people were like, dogging him for it. This was like over five years ago. And I never get in social media debates. I, Often, I shouldn't say never, because I have, but I rarely get in social media debates. But something inside of me was so mad that these people were coming against a person who, who I believe is genuine and true, who, who we have a relationship with. And so I got on there and, and, and um, had a little few things to say. <laughs> Intact, tackle, I believed it was. And I shared scripture about not judging uh, another man's servant and how they did the same thing to Jesus and John the Baptist. They told John the Baptist, well, the way you minister is, uh, is you know, you, you wear these weird clothes and you eat this rare, rare, weird food. And so you're just weird. And then Jesus, the way you minister is, oh, you're a gluttonous and a drunkard. And you sit with prostitutes. You're, you know, you're not of God. And we're always judging somebody on how they're being led by the spirit to minister. That's a Pharisaic spirit, and that is not of the Lord. Yeah. And so I said, I mean, why are we all mad? These people chose to get baptized by their pa pastor in this way. And, and if you don't, you know, it's like we, the church used to debate over sprinkle someone in baptism or fully dunk them, do it in, uh, you know, people get so bent out of shape out of silly things. Should it be in a tank in, in a church? Should it be outside in a body of river? Because they never had little portable tanks in the Bible. I mean, people can get stuck on stupid, y'all. Seriously. Okay, and so 
it was interesting, though, because in this conversation, then I had an atheist come in and was trying to talk it to me and was very respectful. And because I met him with respect, it's hard to disrespect someone who talks to you respectfully. And if they do disrespect you and you still meet them with respect, which is hard for me because if someone disrespects me, my inner hood comes out and it's not good. And so I had to really be in the spirit, y'all. And so, but if often, if we give that gentle answer, it turns away wrath. That's what the scripture says, right? And it's interesting because this just came up because someone five years later commented again on that thread that I forgot about five years ago. And it was good. It was a good conversation. I got a witness to an atheist and, and it came down to, well, how do you know for sure? And, I, and, and, and this is the thing. I believe in Christian apologetics, but I believe that my message cannot be with wise and persuasive words alone, but with the demonstration of the spirit's power. And the thing is, is there has to be a walk of faith, y'all. Walk in the spirit. There has to be a walk of faith. And so the spirit always tells us to go and to share the good news. OK, I, I've been on that for a while. He also is not just about making converts. This is where the American church is messed up. It's about making disciples. Okay? So it's not just, oh, someone came to church. That's part of it. That might be the first step, to share and invite them to church and to invite them to come to Christ. Okay? Walk with them. Okay? But eventually, they have to make a decision, and you can't make that decision for them. You can present the gospel. You can share the truth. But they have to make a decision, not just to accept Jesus as Lord, our Savior, but as Lord, Master. And a disciple is a student. And this is the thing. We never graduate from being a student. It's not like high school in the church. Like, oh, I put in my four years. <sighs> Give me my cap and gown. You don't get your cap and gown, friends, until you get your crown when you're in heaven. Okay? That's when we get our robe and our, and our crown. It's not until then. So it, it, this, is like, this is like more than even being like going to school to be a doctor. We're in this for the long haul to be a, a disciple. And the thing is, is disciples, students, learners, they are ones, disciples make disciples. And if you are a disciple, a true disciple, then you're making disciples because that is your command. That doesn't mean that you have to have 100 people following you. Jesus himself only had 12 disciples that he really poured into, and then they poured into other disciples, and then they poured into, and that's how it works. But this is the thing. If you can't have 12, if you can't, you, you can't handle that much. I can't at times handle that much. I'm like, my four kids, that's, that feels like 12 sometimes, right? And then the, then the other people that God has called me into close relationship to pour into, make one. Make one. When I planted the church, when Josh and I planted our church uh, 15 years ago in South Toledo, the Lord I, I got got me good. <laughs> we were in a prayer circle and I have all these, I'm a visionary. I have all these ideas and things don't always happen exactly the way I think that they are. And he said, will you leave the 99 for the one? Make one. Go after one person and, sh and, and, and disciple them. And, and that means you got to walk with them when they're going through hard times. You have to be a listening ear, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That's in, that's in discipleship too. You got you to gotta be compassionate and empathetic, okay? And, and yet you still got to preach the truth in love, okay? Another thing that the Holy Spirit always leads us to go and do is, is, is to share the gospel, make disciples, and abide in him. The Holy Spirit always leads us to abide in the Father and to fellowship with him. Now, listen, I struggled with this point. I'm like, how is being with God going? Right? I'm like, going means making disciples and sharing and evangelism and outreaches and who I'm thinking big, right? And the Lord's like, to do big, you got to do small. Right? If you want to go, part of going is going away and being alone with God. This is what Jesus, God, man, 100% man, 100% God. His earthly ministry, he was like, I'm waking up early. Bye, Peter. Bye, sons of thunder. Y'all a little loud. Let me walk away over here in my quiet place and be with my father. We are so hurried as a generation, as a culture in America, we are so anxious. And it, and it hasn't slowed down because we, we, we had like a, a little hot little second in 2020 when things slowed down. Guess what? We're, we went right back to being just as busy. I'm preaching to myself. Come on. Just as busy, just as hurried, just as anxious as we were before. More so because now things are heavy and people are going through things and we carry that. And this is the thing, friends. If we learn to abide in him, then we're not carrying it. We're laying it down, laying it down, laying it down, laying it down. And so I encourage you, if you don't set time aside to be with God, you will never make the time. 
you'll never make the time. If going to church on Sunday mornings is your only one meal a week, friends, whoo, you're going to be starving. You need to eat multiple times. I used to be, when I first um, came into really discipleship in the early 90s or mid-90s, it was spend your quiet time in, with the Lord in the morning. And that's, what I, and that's how I always started, spending time with God in the morning, except for I was a young adult, so I kind of flipped. I was like, God, I don't care if I do it at night. So I did my time with God at night. And then uh, early on in our marriage, I, I flipped it over, spending time with God in the morning. I always spend time with God. I dropped the kids off for school, and I spend time a good hour with the Lord almost every morning. And then I have learned now that that's not enough for me anymore. I, I, have to, I have to intentionally, I usually like to take a little bit of time right before I pick up the kids. And I spend, even if it's just 15 to a half hour, sometimes if I, I'll make that time longer if I have an early morning meeting. And I spend time with the Lord sometimes in the, in the afternoon. Before I go to bed, y'all, who is heavy again? People, are, people it, we live in a, in a world that just needs Jesus, amen? I had to spend time with God before I go to bed. I cannot go to bed heavy. I cannot go to bed feeling bloated. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. Like, who, who likes to eat a super big meal and then try to go to sleep afterwards and you feel your stomach's all? I mean, and the older you get, I'm telling you, the harder that is. And that's how it is spiritually. Like, if people are, like, throwing different things at me and it's, like, all these heavy conversations and, and, and I, have to, I have to give back. I can't give what I don't have. And so I had to, every night, man, I usually go to bed sleeping to either worship the word or a really good podcast of somebody I trust. And I always set a timer. So just in case they say something crazy, it's going to go off at a certain time <laughs> when I'm sleeping. <laughs> yeah, I don't like just anything playing when I'm sleeping unless it's the word of God. But listen, this is my personal thing. And I'm not saying you have to do that. But what you have to do is you have to go and abide in Christ and find time to spend with the Lord. Because if you don't, friends, we can't do this. We're not strong enough. We can't see Ohio for Jesus. We can't even see the Hesters for Jesus without, without abiding in Christ. We can't even see your personal family, your personal job, your personal neighborhood for Jesus without Christ. We need to abide in him so we know how to walk in him. Amen? Okay, so walking in the spirit is a walk of obedience. The, uh, the spirit tells us sometimes to go, and there's different things that he tells us when we're doing that, how to obey. Walking in the spirit also means obeying when the answer is no. Uh, yeah, I just had to get it out. Right? Amen. Sometimes the answer is no. Oh, my goodness. I don't like to hear no. I don't. I still don't like to hear no. <laughs> but the Lord said, Joy, when you hear no, it is not a personal rejection. Sometimes it's even protection. Right? Sometimes we have to say no. And, and, and we have to realize that when God wants us to say no to something, it's not because he wants to withhold from us. It's because he wants to protect us. And so when we see like the Ten Commandments and it's, you know, we're not supposed to lie or cheat or steal or, or, or adultery or, you know, all these different things, kill, right, murder. And, and, and those are the ones that are the no ones. There's also, you know, love the Lord. That's a yes. <laughs> you know, keep him first. Have no idols. All these different things that we have. These are, these are the black and whites in the Bible that like, no, we can't do these things, right? But again, it's for our protection. It's not because he's trying to withhold something from us. And guess what? We also have to say no to the flesh Ugh. to walk into the spirit. We can't walk in the flesh and walk in the spirit at the same time. It's like in war with each other. They're in contrary to one another. And so we have to not only do exactly, you know, follow the word of God, his 10 commandments and, and the things that are black and white in the Bible, but there's areas in our life that are gray. You might not be able to find a scripture verse that tells you what job you're supposed to have. Exactly. You might not find one. Okay, you got five different college campuses that you got accepted into. You must have been really smart. You, you might not know exactly which one you're supposed to go to. You might not be able to find in the Bible exactly which one you're, 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 gonna, you're supposed to say no to and which one you're supposed to say yes to. But if you have a personal relationship with God and you're abiding in him, you're going to be led by the spirit onto where to go. And so this is what I want to teach you guys, friends, that sometimes to walk in the spirit means to allow God, the spirit of God to govern your words, decisions, and actions. Okay, Galatians 5, 16 to 23 says, so I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Yee. 
For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but you are to be led by the spirit that you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I guess it was heavy back then too. (laughs) And it says this, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, friends. Like, Again, black and white right here. It's like, we do these things, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. That's why the Holy Spirit tells us no, and it's hard. It's hard because our culture is saying, you had a bad day, that's okay. Just have a little wine at the end of the day. Oh, but one, you know, one drink leads to another drink and another drink. You're going to bed drunk every night. (laughs) I'm not an alcoholic. Listen, friends, sin's deceitful. Didn't our pastor just preach that? The deceitfulness of sin. Oh, sexual immorality. I just, I met with somebody and, and was able to minister to them. And they were telling me some heavy stuff. And they were so deceived in their mind that they thought, oh, this isn't sexual immorality when it clearly was. And I had to say, no, 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 no. This is what, you know what I mean? I had to bring them back in. But the sin is deceitful. And so when we see these scriptures, we need, a, we need it needs to be a wake-up call. Like, the, the flesh and the spirit, they're in contrary to one another. And God tells us to say no to these things. Friends, God has called us to walk in the spirit. He's called us to take the high road. He's, he's called us to hear what he is saying and to allow the Holy Spirit to be the place that we actually, that we're not just walking in. One, um, one scholar says that actually if you break down this word to walk in the spirit, it, it really means it could be explained by having a one path that you have walked so many times that it becomes habit. It's like a habitual path that you have walked so many times that you, you know, if you ever woke up in the middle of the night and you had to go to the bathroom and you can't, can't even hardly see because you're like tired and you're like, you know, maybe for like me, I still have my eye mask on. I could walk to the bathroom very clearly even if I can't see at night because I've walked that path many, many times. The Bible has called us to walk in the spirit, that we've walked that path with the spirit so many times that we can clearly walk without, with knowing, no, we shouldn't fall into debauchery. We shouldn't, we shouldn't fall into drunkenness and, and dissension and gossip and all these things that the Bible says, uh, sexual immorality, that the Bible says that these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Because the place in the spirit, that's the place we live. We've walked it so many times. That's our environment. That's our atmosphere. That's where we live. Amen? Come on, friends. We got to get there again. This, this word was convicting to me. I'm just letting you know. This word was convicting to me. I need to get there again in every area. Okay? Amen? Walking in the Spirit, it means obeying when it's time to take it slow. Right? Sometimes the Holy Spirit tells us to go. Sometimes the Holy Spirit says no. And sometimes the Holy Spirit, walking with him, it means taking it slow. Taking it slow. That's number three. You got that point up there? Number three. Walking in the Holy Spirit means taking it slow. Now, if you're like me and you're a gas pedal, You just like to go, 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 go. You get recharged by going. You feel good by going. You like to go. Hey, I see you over there. I see you over there. Let's have fun. Go, 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 go. And then sometimes you run out of gas and it's like, oh, my God, what am I doing? I got five appointments tomorrow and I don't want to talk to anyone. (laughs) Right? And the Holy Spirit's like, you need to pace yourself. You need to learn to take it slow. I remember when Josh and I first got married and he taught me how to dance. <laughs> he had a lot more, he has a lot more still rhythm than I do. I, I thought I could fake it back in the 90s that we didn't have all the cool um, little YouTube and TikTok and all the things that showed us. Everybody can dance now. But back then, only cool people could really, really dance, <laughs> okay? And if you were white and you could dance, you was extra cool because it, it didn't come natural, you know what I'm saying? So my husband, he knew how to dance and he was teaching me how to dance. And, and he was like, honey, like, this is a slow dance. I am the man I lead. I'm like, okay, 
But I just wanted to go a little faster. He's like, no, no, follow my lead. And I had to learn to follow his lead in dancing so that we, that I didn't look like an idiot when we're out at, at dancing places, at weddings and whatnot. And so the Lord reminded me of this and said, you know what? That's how it is with the Holy Spirit sometimes. We don't slow down enough to let him lead. We're way out ahead and we're like, Holy Spirit, come save me. And we start speaking in tongues. He's like, I was way back there. You guys need to slow down and let me lead. Sometimes the spirit says, slow your row. One Greek scholar suggests the best way to translate walk in the spirit in Galatians 5, 16 is a stroll in the spirit. So stroll is a leisurely walk. A person who strolls is not anxious, frustrated person who is fighting to do something or to go, get somewhere. Rather, he is restful, relaxed, unhurried, peaceful, and calm. Oh, that is so my husband. He's, he's just like, let it roll off your back. I'm like, he's like, you always you get too much information. I'm like, slow down. Like, he's just like, chill for Jesus all the time. And I'm just like, but when God tells him to do something, he also will break up a gang fight with a shofar or go witness to somebody that, I look, that looks scary to me or whatever. You know what I mean? But because he's unhurried, he's able to make those kind of impacts. And I, and I have to learn. I just gas. Nope. Slow down. Slow down. Spend time with God. Be unhurried. Oh my gosh. Convicting, convicting, convicting. Anyone else convicted or am I just preaching to myself? Am I talking to myself today? But I do have to preach to myself too, because listen, it's, it's for real. It's, it's a struggle. It's the struggle bus over here. Yeah. I'm, I'm letting you guys know, like I, I I'm so used to rushing that I miss it sometimes. And friends, it's time for us to learn to not be affected by what people say. <laughs> it's time for us to relax. Even though we live in a heavy, crazy, busy, hurried world. And even though our culture says, go, 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 do this, do that, do this, do that. We've got to learn to pull back in. We need to rest. We need to be unhurried. We need to be peaceful. We need to have the calmness of Christ that he was on the boat when the storm was going on. And the disciples were like, we're about to die. And Jesus was like, I have not fulfilled my purpose yet. Chill, y'all. It's good. And he was sleeping. He was sleeping, resting, friends, we've got to learn. We've got to learn because if not, if not, we will always be in front of what God wants to do and we're going to miss it because God did not give us eyes in the back of our heads, even us mothers, <laughs> even us mothers. We don't really have eyes behind our ponytail, <laughs> kids. <laughs> we have to slow down and allow him to lead. Following the Holy Spirit oftentimes means to slow down, take time to hear what he is saying. You know, there's an example in the Bible about this. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing for lack of time, but we see Paul had a vision of the Macedonian man in Acts 16. Do you know that Paul was actually on his way to, he, he was preaching in other other locations. He was in Galatia and he was in, he was actually on his way um, to another location. And the spirit of God would not allow him to go into that place. St the spirit of God actually stopped him, said no. Okay. And so then Paul, Paul was ready because I picture Paul as a gas pedal. <laughs> oh, Paul, Paul was, he was, he was going, doing a lot. And so he actually, he obeyed because the Holy Spirit stopped him, would not allow him, prevented him really is what the Bible says, prevented him from entering into that region. And so he went to bed and in his dream, in his sleep, he had a dream of a Macedonian man saying, come over here and help us. And I was thinking about that. I thought, you know, why is it that God speaks so often in our dreams? <laughs> and that's why it's the only time sometimes that some of us rest. Slow down enough, quiet enough that he can speak. And I want God to give me dreams. Who doesn't? But I want to hear God every day and every moment. I want to know what it means to abide in him. I want to know what it means to, to walk in the spirit, a stroll, a leisure walk, where it's me and Jesus. I'm unhurried, 
unbothered by the cares of the world, by all the problems that all y'all have, <laughs> all the problems that I have, and that I can rest in his presence enough that I know now it's time to go. So sometimes following the Spirit means slowing down. Walking in the Spirit is a walk of obedience. Obeying when it's time to go. Obeying when he says no. Obeying when he says slow. And obedience, friends, always leads us to grow. Always leads us to grow. God had to change my definition of what it means to grow. Because I had an American mindset, an American pastor, and what they taught me at all the little things that we go to. Of grow means bigger numbers. Grow means more people. And, and it does. We, we do want to see more people. But that's only part of it. Because if we have, we've had, there's been Easter services. We had 700, 800 people in attendance. But if they didn't make it into the kingdom of God or if they're not making it into the kingdom of God because they came to one Easter service or one block party or because we had them at an outdoor service or because we preached the gospel at a red, white, and boom here in Waterville. If they don't change their life, repent, and turn to Jesus, it doesn't matter. And so, friends, I want to encourage you. Growing is not just about nickels and noses. Yeah, growing is not just about having your finances increase. Growing is not just about more people, young people having more friends, having a bigger tribe, a bigger circle, a bigger friend group, or whatever we call it these days. Growing is not just about more. Growing is about maturity. When God looks at growth, it's not just adding numbers to. That is an American entrepreneur mindset, and there is partial truth in that. We do want to see, Jesus did preach uh, to the 5,000, but he had the 12, y'all. Peter did, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit came in, the 120, he did preach, and 3,000 got saved. That's not what I'm talking about. Yes, we want to see people get saved, but friends, sometimes growing, and it doesn't just mean about numbers. Actually, all the time, growing means maturity. When you actually read about growth in the Bible, it's about maturity. It, the purpose of the five-fold ministry, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit is to grow the body, not numerically, but in maturity. Like when justice is born, or, 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 he, he was my biggest baby. But guess what? He's even, he's even bigger now as a 10-year-old, thank God, than when I delivered him. And he's not just in size bigger, but he's mature. He came out, and he, and he was the one who walked the quickest and rode his bike and, and, and jumped into uh, the, you know, he had all these other bro brothers and sisters that he wanted to be like. He still, he wants to be a teenager, even though he's 10. He's like, they got cool haircuts. Why can't I get a cool haircut? I'm like, Shua had his dad buzz cut him up until like 13, dude. Like, you're already, we're already paying more money on you. Stop comparing. <laughs> Right? But there's a maturity level that he has now that he didn't have then, and there's still more maturity to happen. Amen. And guess what? 43 just turned it this week. It's okay. I accept late birthday presents. Don't worry. Just accept. <laughs> I just turned 43 and I have realized I have so much more maturity that needs to take place. Oh my gosh. Here, like in the last week, I'm like, oh God, really? That's me. Oh, he's like been showing me things. And, and my husband's always like bringing up little, in a nice way, like, mm, 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 mm. And I'm like, oh. Like you did it again. <laughs> did it again. I'm like, oh my goodness. There's certain things he don't show you right away. It's 20 something years in the making, and I'm just realizing, man, I need to get better in this area. Right? We never stop growing in the Lord. The moment you stop growing in the Lord is the moment you start dying. It's falling away. What's it called? What do we used to call it? Backsliding backsliding. No one wants to use that word backsliding anymore in the church. But the moment we stop growing, the moment we stop saying yes to God is the moment we stop growing. And the moment we stop saying yes to God is the moment we allow compromise into our life. And that's the moment we start backsliding. Oh! <laughs> we see who it's all about here. <laughs> <laughs> that is a quote from Josh. I didn't give him his proper credit, and he must have known it. 
There it is. The moment you stop saying yes to God is the moment you stop growing. I don't want to stop growing. I don't want to backslide. And this is what, why we need the Holy Spirit, because sometimes the Holy Spirit leads you to do something that he may not lead someone else to do. Sometimes the Holy Spirit might say, you know what, you need to take a season where you're not. He just showed me something else that I really, really like to do, and I don't think it's necessarily sinful for me to do. It's just a little bit of entertainment that I like. But when I was studying on something else for me personally that I'm personally struggling, struggling with right now, I, and I start reading some stuff, not just in the Bible. I, was, I got on this blog, and I was like, oh, my gosh. And then the Lord showed me some scriptures, and I was like, ah. Uh. I realized for me right now in this season, I got to say no to that so that I can focus on this. And that's called personal convictions. That's why I'm very vague with that right now because I used to tell all the details in my younger years of preaching and then other people tried to take on my personal convictions and God never told them to not do that, right? So I know some of you nosy people are trying to figure out what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. Just know that God sometimes tells me no on certain things that he might not tell you no and so I ain't gonna judge you if you do it. And don't judge me if I don't do it. And sometimes God tells me okay on certain things that he might tell you no. And guess what? I ain't going to judge you. You don't judge me. And that's why our eyes need to be fixed on Jesus and not always on one another. Because it's about growing in him. And, being, and the only way we grow in him is when we're obedient to him. Walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit. Those who walk in the spirit will do it daily. It's a moment by moment choice for holiness, for righteousness, for growth. And this is the thing. If you want to measure something, if you're growing in the spirit, measure it by this. We talked about the gifts of the spirit. We talked about, um, you know, wisdom and knowledge and, and those things. And, I, and, and even though they are gifts and they're given to you, I do believe you can grow in maturity in those things. But something that is not a gift that needs to be grown in every single one of our life is called the fruit of the spirit. And I'm going to end with this. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 lists the fruit of the spirit. I'm not sure if we, oh, we do have it up there, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, which means patience or long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such things. There is no law. Fruit is not a gift. Fruit is not given. Fruit is grown. It starts as a seed. I just planted my most best plants I've ever planted in my life, finally, this summer with my sister. And we, we transplanted some, and some died right away. She said, they're going to be ugly. Like, you ain't going to want to show no transplants are ugly. It won't be to next year that they look really good. Just like, but you can rebuke me if you want. And so I did. I was like, no, my plants are going to be beautiful. <laughs> she told me to do it, so I did. And, and sure enough, some of my plants, actually, God is like, we had all that rain. God bless some of these, these babies look really good. I do need a weed and get some mulch on there. But they look really, really good. But they start it as a seed. And the fruit of the spirit, you, I'm, I'm telling you, I feel like my patience might just be like popping out the ground a little bit, but it still feels like a seed in my life, even though I claimed it for 2020. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> I'm like, okay, God, you really knew how to groom me in patience 2020. All right. That was the fruit. I, every year I pick a fruit to focus on. I picked joy this year. Hallelujah. <laughs> After patience, you need to pick joy. It's so fun. <laughs> so fun. But you know what? I have been attacked with joy this year more than I have in a long time. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I cry more now than I did as a teenage girl. What the heck is wrong with me? <laughs> oh, friends, we got to grow. We got to grow in the Lord. We need to mature in him. We need to grow in love, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, kindness, self-control. We got to develop these things in our life. We got we, we to answer harsh words with, with gentleness. The world is harsh. Culture is harsh. We need kindness and, and, and we, need, we need to have these things in our life because to win Ohio for Jesus, we need to walk in the spirit. Would you guys go ahead and bow your heads? Close your eyes. Be quiet before the Lord for just a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are so good. If you're in this place 
and you feel like, man, I really need to learn how to walk in the spirit a little bit more. And one of these these things, maybe it's, you know, you know, for me, I was like, man, I really need to go a little bit more. I've been in my circle. We've been out of practice. We've been social distancing. <laughs> we haven't really shared the gospel as much as, as we, I think, as we used to. You know, if that's something that you're convicted about, man, allow the Lord to move on your heart. Maybe you've been getting back on track and, and, you, and you've been feeling so busy that you haven't had the time with God that you used to have. And the Lord's saying, man, it's time for you to slow. Slow your roll. Maybe you're in this place and you're like, man, whew, God has told me no on some things. It's not, it's, he didn't tell my husband, no, I wish he would have. Because I got to say no when he gets to say yes. But God's told me no on some of these things. And I need to be obedient. Maybe that's you in this place. Or maybe you're in this place and you're like, man, God, I just want to get to the place that I'm growing in you again. If that's you, would you just raise your hand before the Lord? Raise your hand before the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Would all of you, if you're able to, stand to your feet? I just want to speak a blessing over you. And those uh, few people who, who feel like they, that they need some extra prayer, I want you to feel comfortable to come up and uh, I'm going to pray for you as well. But Heavenly Father, I just speak a blessing over this body. God, I know that this body has everything that they need for life and godliness that resides in them. Some of them have it just as a form of a seed that it needs to grow a little bit more. Some of them have a small plant. Some of them have pl a, a, a plant that is blooming and it has fruit that's for others to, to have, but maybe they have some weeding that they need to do. Maybe they have some pruning that needs to happen so they can bear more fruit. God, would you show your people right where they're at? Because, God, they don't want to stay where they're at. Because that's the start of once you stay too long of then going backwards. But, God, they want to move forward with you. So would you begin to show them where they're at so that they can take inventory. And so that they can say, Lord, here I am again. I'm willing to walk in the Spirit. And I know it's not a speed walk. Lord, it's a stroll with you. It's a walk in the cool of the day in the garden like Adam and Eve did. It's a walk of a, a, a walk and an intimacy and a talk time with you where I can hear you and you can hear me and we can be together. And, and Lord, I thank you for just ministering to your people. Even now, Lord God, would you bless them? Would you keep them? Would you fill them with your peace? Would you make them unhurried, unbothered? Would you give them the calmness of Christ? Would you break off worry and depression off of their lives right now, Lord Jesus? God, give them ears to hear what you're spirit is speaking. God, I pray for divine appointments this week, Lord God, that they would see what you're doing in someone else's life. Maybe it'd be some, a cashier or a waitress that they would be able to, to speak encouragement and love and just drop seeds of the gospel right there, Lord God. Maybe it's a friend that they haven't spoken to in a while that you're moving on their heart to call and to reconcile and to share the truth of your word. God, I thank you, Lord God, that you would help them, enable them to walk in the spirit, the walk of obedience that you've called us all to. In Jesus' name, God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you, God.